Today I thought I would do one of those longer videos talking about everything I did from the beginning to now in becoming financially successful. Basically, how did I become financially free? What did I do when I started out? What was my path? What was the exact steps that I did in order to get there? And my hope with doing this video is that it'll help a lot of you guys to maybe get on that same path and understand, hopefully not make the same mistakes that I did, but get there faster. One of the big things that I believe is really important. And one thing that I really practice is to try to be as transparent as possible. I don't wanna hide anything. I don't wanna put information that I talk about behind paywalls. I know that might seem funny to you guys since I have a Bulldog Mindset membership and I have a Well That Never Runs Dry, which is a more expensive program that teaches people how to become financially free. Those things are designed really to give you a step-by-step -step format, really in-depth instruction on each one of the topics and then also to give you guidance, coaching, answering questions, creating a community, because a lot of the things that, that I tell you, I can tell you these things right. in YouTube videos, but are you gonna have them in the right sequential order? Are you gonna process all these things? So I really don't hold anything back in most of these videos. No. If anything, I don't share information that I don't think will be interesting to people who aren't really ready to take action on those things. So I wanna share with you everything here. Like I show my income reports every single month. I try to be as transparent as possible in that and genuine as possible. And my whole philosophy in business is give away 90% for free and charge for 10%. So far that's worked for me. That, in fact, we're gonna get into that when I get into the story here and how I developed that philosophy and how that's worked for me. And that's why I'm not afraid to give you everything here in YouTube videos, knowing that if you're getting value and you're getting benefit from this and I've helped you in your life and I've helped you transform your life, that you would be willing to purchase something that I'm selling that's gonna help you even more because it's concentrated, because it's focused, or you get some of my time and you get the community that I'm building. That's kind of my philosophy. And I think a lot of people disagree with that. They don't understand how that works. They try to hide their secrets and things like that. And I get it, I get it, but no, I don't think that's the way to go. So let's start off by talking about how I started out as far as my journey into financial independence and just making money in general. So when I started out I'm early on, I was really, as a kid, pretty lazy. I wasn't super ambitious. I was shy, awkward. I didn't read books. In fact, in school, I pretended to read books that we had to do book assignments for. I didn't really get good grades at all. I played a lot of video games. Okay. And so what ended up happening was that I think when I was around 10 or 11, I had a computer course and I got to play on these Apple IIe computers and learn basic. And I was pretty hooked on that. So that was pretty cool experience for me. And I really enjoyed that. I remember having these floppy disks where I had these programs that I wrote and I wrote, made all these programs. I would stay in the computer lab and do that. And after that, I think I got a personal computer shortly afterwards because I was interested in computers. I was still playing a lot of video games and I learned everything technical wise about the computer, how to build computers. And I tried to use QBasic and, and did a little bit of programming there, but it wasn't much there. And then fast forward till I don't know, maybe when I was 14 or 15, I was playing these MUDs, these multi-user dungeons, which are the precursors to World of Warcraft and things like that, where I ended up wanting to play this game while I was at school so I could level up in this game. And so I started downloading these clients that uh, allowed you to connect to a bulletin board system, a BBS, and play these games, but they were programmable. So I ended up writing these complex scripts that played the game for me while I was at school. And it was pretty cool because like I kept on modifying the script and like people would figure out what I was doing so they'd kill me. So then I'd have to modify the script so that it would attack people and then you get timed out so you'd have to relog in. So I ended up creating this quite complicated program and it was out of necessity. And, and you might be wondering, where am I going with this and from a financial perspective? The reason why I'm telling you this whole story is because I want you to understand what got me down the path of programming. I really enjoyed doing that and I really wanted to create my own video games. That was what, something that I was super into. I didn't really have an entrepreneurial mindset, but I wanted to be a programmer at that point. And so I actually had downloaded some source code because I wanted to create my own mud. I thought about creating my own game, my own world, because I really enjoyed it. And I basically taught myself C and C++ from just looking at the source code, modifying it, uploading it. I didn't even really know how to do much, just scrambling the other little pieces of stuff that I could figure out. And I got a rudimentary understanding of C and C++. I could modify code. I could do stuff like that. And after that, what ended up happening was 
I went on to college and I went to yeah. join a computer science major. And that was sort of the experience that made me, it was disillusioning for me because I didn't really enjoy that at all. I didn't want to make loops in Java. I remember my Java professor, actually she stunk. <laughs> like she didn't use deodorant or something. It was just like, it was just a horrible experience. And I did that year in college, but I, it almost turned me off to programming in computers and technology. And I was gonna switch majors to IT actually, because I was like, if this is what programming is, I don't wanna do this. But I got a job during the summer at HP actually as a contractor doing testing. And the way that I got the job was kind of interesting. And this is my first financial piece of things. Aside from, I think that previous summer before I went to college, I'd worked at MCI. This was a phone company at the time. Their call center actually doing technical support for printers. And that was just a crazy grueling job, but I was really good. I understood computers really well as far as troubleshooting DOS and, and Windows problems and drivers and all that stuff. So I was pretty good at technical support. That was a job. I think I was making like something like $9 or $10 an hour. And it seemed like a lot of money to me at the time. And I was, you know, one of the top performers there because they measured you on your average hand handling time. So how quickly did you get through calls? And I, I optimized that to be as good as I could. Emerge. Skipping forward to school. So I took a summer job at HP and actually the way I got that job was <laughs> when I interviewed for the job, the two test leads that were, were working for the company, they were playing EverQuest. And in the interview, they asked me about EverQuest and they asked me if I'd be interested in playing EverQuest and I was super geeked out about that. I had just built a brand new PC and so they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they basically hired me because I was gonna be another guy that was playing EverQuest with them. It was, it was kind of funny, but it got my foot in the door. And so I got this testing job and it was a decent job. I think I was making like 20 bucks an hour, which at that time was way more than any of my friends. And I thought, wow, I'm doing good here. I'm making 20, I think maybe I got a raise to 25 bucks an hour really quickly there, which was awesome pay. And when I did the math on that, at that time when you got out of college, the idea was that you get a job making 40, 50, 60,000 dollars a year, but I was already making that. Right. So I was like, you know what? There's no point in going back to school because I'm already doing well. I'm already making like close to 50, 60 K a year. That's an awesome salary. Yeah. At the time, again, this is 20 something years ago. So I didn't go back to school. And so I worked that job doing testing. And what I found was that it was pretty boring. I had to learn some printer languages in order to troubleshoot some of these tests, but I was basically basically just executing tests and then sending them over to someone who did comparison on these tests and stuff. And so what ended up happening was that I started looking into these tests and really wanted to dig into this and figure out how these tests worked because I was learning PCL printer language and PostScript another printer language. And these tests that test these printers were in these languages, they're written in these languages. So I started not just finding the defects right. in the printers from these tests, but actually trying to figure out what line of code was causing this defect. And so what I would do is most people that were doing the testing, they would look at th these comparison sheets that these comparators would, that were looking for differences in these two printouts. And they would flag the ones and see which ones were actually you know, problems with the tests and rerun some of the tests and stuff like that. And then send them over to developers to look at them and, and fix them and give an analysis of it, but I went really in depth and I said, let me figure out exactly what line of code, what command, so I would take these tests and when there was a problem with the test, I would then strip down the test. I remember taking the first approach was to take half of the code and remove it and then see if there was still an error. And then I would narrow it down and I would basically eventually got to the point where I could get it down to like a line of code and I'd say, oh, this postscript command, when you do it in this sequence, it causes the printer to error. It does not actually produce the correct result or it would actually error out and, and kill the printer. And so I could produce five lines of code that would kill the printer. And pretty quickly, the developers got super interested in what I was doing because they're like, damn, you got, you're troubleshooting stuff to a lower level than we are and you don't even have the source code. Like you can't even see the code. Like you're figuring it out from the test itself. And so I got a job offer to join the developer team to help them and to be kind of a junior developer. So that was my first big break there. I was actually gonna get paid to write code. I was super, super excited. And that was just a wonderful time for me. And so I got my own computer and cubicle and I started working on writing tests for these printers, which was pretty cool. And I think I got a pay raise up there to, that might've been where I went to $25 an hour. It was enough that my friends were just, were super jealous of me. I was making like twice what they were making. And so I did that for a while. And and I didn't really have any kind of entrepreneurial ideas in my mind. I was living also on the paycheck to paycheck mentality. Now, there was one smart thing I did at that time that I didn't realize, which was when I got out of college, because I was living in the dorms. So what ended up happening was when I needed to find a place to live, 
I wanted to buy a house. And again, I wasn't smart enough to think in my head that I was gonna do this long-term real estate investment, but what I did at that time and what my thinking was, was that I just don't wanna pay rent, and so I looked for a house. And you know, I was 19 years old, so trying to buy a house at 19 years old, I only had maybe a couple of grand. It was extremely difficult. I talked to a lot of real estate agents. They are like, ah, no, nah, it's not gonna happen. Finally, I got this one real estate agent that I think his name was Mike Kelly, actually, now that I remember. This was in Idaho, in Boise, Idaho, and he was like, we'll look for some shacks. So we literally found this shack that was $68,000, and it wasn't even hooked up to city water, and so I had to dig my own own ditch like to connect it to city water to save myself some costs on that and I couldn't find a loan on it finally I found this shady loan company gave me like a 13% interest rate with a two-year prepayment penalty but hey I had my house right and so I bought this house and so at 19 years old I had a house and okay. it came became the party house because you know what 19 year old kid has a house so I ended up buying that house and that was a very smart move even though I didn't realize it at the time and I actually ended up holding on to that house for I think close to 20 years before I sold that house. I think I sold it for about $150,000. So it didn't go up quite as much as you would expect in that time, but it almost tripled. So what ended up happening was that I got this job offer. I got this call from this company that was looking for a software developer to work at Xerox on a contract. And they basically just were like, hey, do you want this job? I was like, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll take the job. And then they interviewed me. They just did a phone interview with one of the guys that was on the project. And it was this short interview. It was so ridiculous. It wasn't even technical at all. And I was not a great programmer at that time. I had some programming skills. I taught myself some programming, but I really didn't know Visual C++ and C++, which was what this job entailed. But you know, I BS my way through the interview a little bit and they didn't really ask any difficult questions and they basically offered me the job. And when I asked how much that they were willing to pay me, they offered me $75 an hour. And not only was it $75 an hour, but the recruiter was like $26.50 an hour will be per diem since you live in Idaho, but you're gonna have to move to California. And so I was just floored. I was like, what the hell? I'm mean, here I was making $25 an hour, double what my friends were making, thinking I was making this great money. And I was was going to be given an offer to triple what I was making. Way more money than my parents were making, than my friends were making, than anyone I knew was making, like the amount of money that lawyers make. And I was 19 years old, so I jumped on that opportunity. So I was like, yeah, I'll be there in two weeks. So I literally packed up everything that I had in my Geo Metro. And I was also working on, at that same time, building an accessory dwelling, like a turning the garage into uh, another, it was gonna be this pimp studio apartment, actually, but there were some complications with that, but I was gonna live in the studio and then rent out the house. That never came to be because I ended up moving to Southern California, because uh, this job was in El Segundo, which is basically outside of LA, Area and I was going to try to find a place in Santa Monica. And the reason why I wanted to live in Santa Monica was because that song, that Everclear song, Santa Monica, I was like, how cool it will be to tell my friends I live in Santa Monica. Anyway, what ended up happening was I took the job. I immediately went to the to Barnes and Noble and I bought a book called Visual C++. It was this fat book. And I just started reading that frantically because I knew that I did not know enough for that job and I needed to actually learn C++. So I was reading the hell out of that book and I only had about two weeks, packed up everything, drove to LA. And that first night in LA was just crazy because I was just scared. I was 19 years old. I had never done anything by myself. And here I drove, not across the country, but from Idaho to California by myself in this Geo Metro with everything I owned in a strange place not knowing anyone in the big city, scary. It was a surreal experience, but I talk about all the time for you guys about moving outside of your comfort zone. And this was a huge move outside of my comfort zone. It was something that I had to do because it was a no brainer, you know, obviously. I remember when I first got there that I was scared to leave the house. I was scared to go on the freeways in this car. And at this time also, it wasn't like you had GPSs. You had MapQuest, like you had to print MapQuest directions at this time. That's how it was. And it was a bit of a of scary experience, these big freeways and everything like that. And that first night, I stayed at this temporary like weekly rental because you can't just get a monthly rental in Santa Monica, California, at least at the time. Like you had to get on a rent list to, to get notified when there's rentals. But And when I woke up the next morning, my car was gone. <laughs> and everyone told me about LA, like don't look people in the eyes, carjackings, all this stuff. And I was like, how the hell my car got stolen the first night? And then 
Finally, I looked around and I saw a towing sign. And what happened was there was a miscommunication. They didn't know that I was a tenant there, that I was staying at the place or I didn't have a sticker or whatever it was. And my car got towed. So I had to walk for like, I think it was four or five miles to the tow company, pay to get my car out of tow. And then I was okay, but it was definitely scary. So then at that point, I started working for a company for Xerox as a contractor. I really didn't know what I was doing. I was really in over my head, but I decided to do it. I had to basically sink or swim, right? I had to fake it till I, I can make it. And I was reading that C++ book, I was studying, I was asking a lot of questions. And fortunately with a big company like that, I think the first two weeks, they're just like giving me manuals to read and to study some of the source code. Eventually after two weeks or so, they gave me a little bit of training and then had me looking at some bugs, fixing some basic bugs in the printer there. Fortunately, because I had learned printer languages, that was the thing that they really wanted to hire me for. I didn't realize at the time, but it was a rare thing. Very few people knew printer languages, but I understood printers, I understood printer languages. So I was able to fix some defects there and do some work there. And it was a decent job, but what ended up happening was bad. I'll admit it here because I didn't really have the motivation or the drive at that point. I didn't realize what the opportunity was, but I ended up actually getting laid off from that job. And I think it was mostly because there was a group of testers that I was hanging out with and we were playing Magic the Gathering in the morning like before work and on lunch breaks and it just looked bad and I wasn't really producing a high volume of work and I think that's what ended up really killing the deal for me. There were some downturns and stuff like that but yeah I think that was the big thing that I had screwed up basically okay. Well one thing I did figure out when I got to Santa Monica and I got this job was then this is where I started to do the math because I was like I'm making like 170, 180,000 dollars a year equivalent and I said to myself I was like how long will it be before I'm financially free, before I become a millionaire? That's what I was thinking at the time if I start saving my money. And I was smart enough to come up with a strategy thinking I'm going to live on as little as money as possible, basically live on $30,000, $40,000 a year if, if I can, save as much money as possible and basically try to save $100,000 a year with taxes and everything. I could do that. And I did the math on it. I mean, the math is simple. How long to become a millionaire? It'll take 10 years of saving $100,000. Well, that sucks. And then I factored in inflation. And I said, okay, that's going to be about 13 years for the equivalent of what a million dollars was back then. And then I said, what if I invested this in the stock market at a 10% return? It didn't change it very much. It changed it to 11 years. So I was like, what the hell? How is anyone going to get rich? Because at that time, making around 170, dollars a year at 19 years old, I was like, I'm making more money than anyone I know has ever made in their life after working for 30, 40 years. I didn't know anyone that was making that kind of money besides doctors and lawyers. And I didn't know any myself. And I was like, so how the heck, if I'm making the top 10%, probably 5% of salaries, how is it possible to become rich, especially to do it young. There just doesn't seem any way to do that. And then I realized that saving money was not the way. So at that time, I wasn't really that keen on business. I didn't really understand business. So I started researching and I found that the wealthiest people in the world, and especially in the United States, that they had invested in real estate. In fact, at that time, I had discovered Donald Trump. It's kind of funny, like this is 20 something years ago. And I read a lot of what he was talking about, some of his books. And I just started studying this concept of investing in real estate. And I found this book, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor by Gary Keller. And I read through this book and this book changed my life. This book was like foundational to everything that I am today. This is this was the big stepping stone here. So this was the first thing because I realized that real estate investment was the way. And this gave me a plan. This gave me an actual some spreadsheets, some tables that showed if you bought a property every single year, what could you accomplish? Like, what would this be worth? and a strategy for doing this, a real simple strategy for doing this. And I got it, it made sense. I was like, no, and I can't remember coming up with a plan at that time and I was like, all right, very worst case scenario. All I have to do is buy one property every single year. And here's the thing, see, cause when I say this, I get a lot of pushback from a lot of you guys and I get it. A lot of you guys are like, oh, just buy one property a year. It's not that hard, I get it. But it isn't because you can put 10% down on a property. And at that time, yes, I was making a lot of money, but there was a period that's coming up where I took a job making $60,000 a year and I was still able to do this. And at the time, yeah, prices were lower. I found properties for $100,000 at that time. 10% down on a $100,000 property is $10,000. So you have to save $10,000 or $15,000 in a year, which, yeah, if you're not making a lot of money, that might seem like a lot, but 
can you save $1,000 a month? Can you save $1,500 a month, $2,000 a month? If you really are willing to do it and to live like a poor person, which I was, I slept on a mattress on the floor for a very long time and ate macaroni and cheese for a very long time. If you're willing to do that, you can probably scrape together that money or you can spend the money that you have right now on investing in your skills and improving your skill set so that you can get a higher paying job. My whole sequence of doing this is get a high paying job, which you'll see as the story unfolds, you start a business because that takes some time to get that going and then start investing in real estate. Right. Real quick though, by the way, you know, if you're listening to this video in, in this long, click the link down below, book a free 15 minute call with a member of my team and figure out your financial freedom plan. Because that's one thing I talked about the Well That Everyone Strive program. You know, what I'm describing to you, how I became financially free, I took all of this that I'm about to tell you in the story and I condensed it it down into what do you need to do to actually replicate this in five to 10 years instead of 20 years. Or I mean, it didn't take me quite 20 years, but let's say 15 years or so. So I condense all that down and that is what is my Well That Never Runs Dry program. So click the link down below. You owe it to yourself to at least book a call and find out. Talk to someone on my team, see if you're a good fit and good financial freedom plan for you so that you can actually do this because it is quite possible. Like I said, you're hearing my story. I'm telling you everything that's happened and you'll see how these pieces fit together. So go check that out. And getting back to the story, basically I had figured this out. I'd read this book and my plan was if I bought one property per year, which again, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 I'd have to save per year or maybe $20,000 Right. Then worst case scenario, in 15 years, my plan was as I could sell the first property I bought. Now, you might say, well, how does that work? With my math here, let's say I bought a property for $100,000. In 15 years, I know that it's going to double. It's very unlikely that it wouldn't double in 15 years. And I've owned real estate and been investing in real estate for 20 something years now. And I can tell you that most of my properties from the beginning have tripled, but in 15 years, they certainly all doubled. I don't know a property that hasn't doubled in value. Not to say that it's an absolute certainty, but it's gonna be pretty close to that. So my thinking was you bought one property for $100,000. At the end of 15 years on year 16, you sell that one for 200. You take some of that money, not a lot, like 20, $30,000. You buy another property with that, and then you live off of the rest of that. And then on year 17, you sell the second property you bought and repeat, and it just keeps on going forever and ever, and you'll be fine and you'll keep on getting richer and richer. Right. So that was my original plan. And then I thought, even if I'm wrong on that, the backup plan is that if I buy one property every year in 30 years, the 31st year, I'll have paid off the first property because I'm getting a 30 year mortgage and I'm rich. I'm literally retired. So at that time I was 20 years old. So I said, okay, 20 plus 30, that's 50 at the worst. So I can retire and be at least rich at 50 years old. Because if you think about it then, if you're selling an entire paid off property at that point, and again, with the other plan, the 15 year plan, you'd still owe some money on your mortgage. So you'd still have to pay off that, but you'd still have plenty of money left over. Right. So that was kind of the idea. But the idea with this one was that worst case scenario in 30 years, you'd have a fully paid off property and really a $100,000 property might be worth $300,000 in that time frame, And you could just live off of that. And so you're gonna be doing well and every year you're gonna be doing better and better as you have these paid off properties that are just gonna kick off rent. You don't even have to sell the property at that point. So that was the strategy there that I had, which was, it, those were both kind of primitive strategies, but I knew from reading this book that these things would work because I knew the math on this. So what ended up happening was I didn't immediately start buying properties after that because I was still in LA and, and there's there a lot of things going on in my life at that time. What what ended up happening was that I did lose that job at Xerox, which was unfortunate. And I ended up having to try and find another job. I ended up finding a job at this real small startup company that was in Phoenix. And they weren't, weren't gonna pay me $75 an hour, but I think they paid me like 56 or $60 an hour. It was close enough where I was like, oh my God, somehow I magically did this again. Because once you start making a lot of money, it becomes easy to make a lot of money. Right? Because once you have a job paying $75 an hour, you're not really gonna get a job paying $20 an hour anymore because you now have that experience and, and you can say that's what my previous salary was. So anyway, I got that job and I was working there and then this was when 9-11 happened. So I only was there for like six months before the planes hit the, the buildings and that it was in the financial industry. It was basically, that was it. They were like, we're not laying you off and they were a startup, but you can't continue working here. Or you can keep working here, but we won't pay you. So I actually stayed there in the office and looked for a job for a while because they let me, because they're like, we don't care. And so 
I actually couldn't find a really good job. So that kind of sucked. But I did improve my C++ skills. My programming skills actually started getting really good at that point. And so what I ended up doing at that point was I actually moved to Florida and stayed with my parents for a little bit. And again, I had this idea of buying properties in my head, but I knew what the plan was, but I couldn't execute on that because I didn't have city income coming in. So I stayed with my parents and I started looking for a job. I finally found a job in New Jersey. And so I got this job at this company called Macro4 doing some post sales programming support in New Jersey, flew up there for an interview, took this job. And the very first task they had me do was to reverse engineer this binary output <laughs> code. And I just like, remember printing this all up and hanging them on the walls. And I was looking at binary code, like basically hexadecimal type of just the code there. It wasn't human readable code, right? I was looking for patterns and I found patterns in this. And I was able to, to basically figure out that what we were looking at was was this ancient language, very, very rarely used language called Metacode. And I reverse engineered this entire thing. So I ended up creating this software using C++ that would take this Metacode output and basically reverse engineer it and come up with the source code from that. It was just this crazy task. I ended up saving that company probably a million dollars by doing this. But of course, they didn't give me any of that. I was a contractor and I had this boss that was just this brow beating, micromanaging boss. I just hated the job and he just made life miserable for me there. And I got into, he was almost like, like a father that I was arguing with. I never had problems with any coworkers or anything, but this guy, he just grated my nerves. He just was just always micromanaging me, which just just drove me nuts. So, you know, at that time in life too, I was still goofing off. I wasn't doing a lot of stuff, but what I did start doing was I started creating my own web page. So I created this web page at smoimo.com. That was kind of my nickname at the time, S S M O I M O.com. And I was playing Magic the Gathering a lot after I started playing it again, because I used to play it when I was in high school, but I started playing it again at that company at Xerox. I remember what happened was this new thing came out. It was called a Palm Pilot. You might recognize this device, but it was this little handheld tablet thing is like an, per, an organizer PDA type of thing. And I thought it was super, super cool. And so I wanted to learn how to program for it. So I taught myself how to program for it. And I ended up making, I couldn't really think of a good application to make except for a life counter from Magic the Gathering. So I ended up programming in C this life counter from Magic the Gathering. And it was actually pretty cool. I added a lot of cool features to it. There wasn't anything like that on the market at all. And so I didn't really know what I was doing at this time. Also, there wasn't APIs. You couldn't easily set up web pages. I was setting up my web page using Hot Dog and Dreamweaver for some of you guys that, that know that and creating my own web server and uploading the HTML files there. It was pretty archaic stuff there. But I decided that I was gonna make it so that I would sell this Palm Pilot software. And this was really my first entrepreneurial thing that I had ever done, right? And what I did was I was trying to figure out how do you make it so you can sell something like this? Because there wasn't, shopping carts, there wasn't platform, there wasn't any of the stuff at this point in time. And so I made it in order to use the software. I did kind of a shareware model because at the time I remember growing up, I always did these shareware games where you'd have to get a code to unlock it. And so I made it so that if you got a registration key, you could unlock the software and have the full features of this Magic the Gathering Life Counter. I called it Mally, Ma Magic Gathering Life Counter, counter Mally. And so I created this and I programmed it to have this code that was generated, but then I needed some way to sell people this code and to generate unique codes. Right? So what I did was I learned Perl programming language and then I connected it with PayPal. At the time, PayPal did exist, but there was a very primitive a API. You had to write your own code to be able to process an incoming payment request and you had to pretty much do it in Perl. So I made this Perl code that on the server would generate the registration code that would match like some unique ID that that came from the device or, or a username that they use. I had this kind of algorithm that I, I figured out. And so I did this and I charged $5 for this Magic the Gathering Life Counter and I put it up on, on a website. And then I had emailed this Magic the Gathering magazine and told them about it. And they put a little tiny article in there talking about Magic the Gathering Life Counter and with my website. And I started getting orders. So I, I don't remember exactly how many I sold, but it was probably something like 50 or 60. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. This is awesome. I'm getting $5 a pop here, but I didn't really know how to advertise it. I didn't really know what to do with it anymore. It wasn't a huge amount of money. It was just kind of cool. And I was making so much money from my job. So I didn't really see the business idea behind this. And so I, I 
I kind of just let it die off. And it was a good experience to, to learn some web development and stuff like that. And in the meantime, what ended up happening was I just hated this job and finally they laid me off. <laughs> I guess they probably didn't like me very much either, even though I had saved them a huge amount of money. And so I was so happy. This was the first job I was ever happy that I got laid off. I remember coming back home and being so excited because I got laid off and I could leave. And so I actually went back to Florida and stayed with my parents again. And then, and I started looking for jobs and I couldn't find a job. I was trying to get jobs in Florida with defense contractors, but it was really hard. It was really difficult to get jobs, even though now at this point, I was really good at C++. Like I was using the site called Top Coder and I was competing on there. I was basically one of the top competitors on there for a while. And so I was really, really, really good because I'd really honed my crafts. This is where I started to get rid of some of my laziness because I I built that life counter, that Palm Pilot app, and I was really focusing on honing my craft there. And so I still couldn't find a job. And finally, my old connection, remember in, in Idaho, the guy that, uh, his name was actually Chuck, and he had hooked me up with that job because I played EverQuest. I got reached out to him and I was like, man, I need to get a job. And so finally he hooked me up with this test lead position. And I was like, this kind of sucks because here I am a programmer and I'm a really good programmer now and I can't get a job as a programmer. I have to get a job as a test lead, but that's not what I want to do. But there was no other option. So I was like, all right, I'll take this job. And then when I negotiated the salary for it, it was basically like 70 or $80,000 a year. It was not much compared to what I was making. And I was a contractor as well. So I was like, all right, fine. I packed up all my stuff, moved back to Boise, Idaho. And then in the meantime, that the rent property I had, it had passed through a lot of hands and I'd almost sold it because it was just such a headache because I wasn't getting rent and, and shit was getting destroyed and it was costing me money. But the guys that I was going to sell this property to, they gutted the house before closing because I was like, oh yeah, you can start doing some construction ahead of time. I should not have done that because they were going to rehab the house. And they backed out on the deal. So I ended up having this house that was basically stripped down that I had a, a tenant that used to live in there that his aunt or something, she called him up and we made some kind of agreement where he like did some work and fix up the house and then he could stay there at a discounted rent. So that, that ended up saving the deal. But I got back to Boise and now the house was in decent condition. It was okay, but I didn't live there at that point. I had the tenant that was living there and this guy was just, he was kind of a pain in the ass. He was really redneck hickish and he didn't pay his rent on time. And it was just, it was a big headache. But I bought a new house, like a, a townhouse over there. And I moved into that. And then I had my job at HP, but I didn't have a lot of money at that time. And I had some saved up. I'm, I'm not making a huge amount of money at, the, at this point. And so I bought this townhouse for about $110,000 and negotiated down from 120. And then I said, well, I should buy the one next door. And so at that same time, I negotiated that one down to 110. And so I bought my property and I lived in it. And then I bought a rental property next to it that was right next to it for the same and put another 10 grand down. And so this was the beginning of my buy one property per year. In fact, I had bought two that year because I bought one to live in and I bought, and now I had a total of three properties. I was a real estate investor. And the whole idea was I was thinking, I'm gonna live in these properties for two years, get owner occupied interest rate, and then I'm, I'm gonna move to the next property and keep buying properties. And so fast forwarding a little bit here, I worked that job at HP and I hated it. But there was this one guy that I sat next to that, uh, you know, in the cubicle next to me, that was a developer that was working on some testing tools, a testing tool actually called Anteater at the time at HP. His name was Brian Fegler. And he was not the best programmer at the time. And so he would be working on these problems and we'd discuss it. And then I would help him with his code. And he was really impressed by that and was really enjoying my help. So he asked that his manager, he's like, can we get John on the team? We need to move him off of doing testing and move him on to programming on this because he's been helping me a lot and he'll be a huge asset to it. And there was this whole political thing. They didn't want to move me. And then finally, they moved me. And this was a dream. I was like, I get to write code and I get to work on this project. And it was a really fun project to work on. And then my coworker ended up becoming a good friend of mine. So we had a lot of fun together writing code and working on this project. And yeah. there's a lot of cool stuff that, that happened there. But yeah. to make this not too long, what ended up happening next was that I took that job, ended up getting promoted, ended up working for HP as an employee, which actually reduced my pay down to $60,000 a year. And I kept buying property. So the next property I bought, I think was this four 
fourplex in Boise, Idaho. And then I bought another fourplex that I lived in one of the units. And then I bought a, a duplex and I just kept on every year buying a property. I bought a duplex, I bought another duplex and I had to do some fix ups on those properties. But what ended up happening after that is I, I met a friend of mine actually. I went to a Magic the Gathering tournament because I was still playing Magic the Gathering. I was playing for a long time. I was actually competing at a semi-professional level. When I was back in New Jersey, I'd gone through to the like, Grand Prix, Tampa, like some professional level events because it was fun. But, and there's some really good players in New Jersey, by the way. But anyway, so what I ended up doing was I was at this tournament and I met this guy, Gabriel, and I was talking to him and we got to like the finals and we battled it out, I think for the final prize of this qualifier for a pro tour qualifier tournament. And, and we kind of did this whole thing where he got the, I think the ticket to go to Japan and I took the money because I didn't really want to go to Japan. I think at that time I was kind of afraid to fly too. So uh, I started talking to him afterwards. He seemed like a pretty cool guy. And he was telling me how he actually runs a Magic the Gathering store in online. So he ran this website. It's called ABU Games. You can go to it now. It's abugames.com. Uh, and I was like, I was amazed by this because I had never heard of someone who didn't work a regular job. I knew that there were people out there. I knew people own stores and own businesses and stuff, but I never knew a guy that was doing that. And he was doing this all online. And I was just fascinated by this. So we ended up becoming really good friends. And I saw how his whole operation was working. We'd hang out all the time and we started playing online poker, which that's a whole nother story. I got super into poker and almost went down that road professionally. And then eventually I started teaching him about real estate investing because he had a lot of money that was coming in. And so he was doing some real estate investing. I was helping him do real estate investing. And then we came up with this idea that of getting our real estate licenses and then going into business together. So I signed a contract with him where I was going to quit my job and I was going to create a new website for him because I could do the programming of that. And we we're going to eventually become 50 50 business partners that had to earn my way in. And I was an idiot at the time, really. Like I ended up not working very much. We ended up playing poker during the day and we did like manual labor type of stuff of packaging cards to ship and stuff like that. But I really did not capitalize on the opportunity. I never really built the software. I argued with him a lot about the way that she should be doing things when I didn't even know what I was doing. And it was just not a good situation at all. And eventually I got impatient and instead of owning 50% of this company, which he was very generous to give me that opportunity, I wanted to make more money because he was paying me as well a salary in addition to giving me part of his company. This was dumb on my part, but I wanted more money. So I got a job at this other company in Idaho and I basically resigned from working with him and gave up my share of the company. Now that company still exists and I'm, I'm sure he's doing really well at this point. I haven't talked to him in a while. I mean, we're still friends, but it was dumb. And this whole time, I mean, I'm still buying properties and, and whatnot. And then uh, while I was working for this software company, a couple of friends of mine, actually going back to the story of way back, Chuck, the guy that had gotten me the job originally at HP as a tester and then the test lead, he had started this company with another coworker at HP, that, another contractor doing payday loans. And so what they wanted to do is they were going to quit their jobs and then they wanted to bring me into the company and have me develop the next version of their software because they had written this kind of hobbled this software together. They, neither one of them were programmers. And so they're going to pay me $100,000 a year, which was better than I was even making at my job and make me a, a business partner in this company that was already doing well. And so I took the offer and you know what I did? This is bad. I revamped their ACH system. That's the automatic cash handling system and made it so that I rewrote all that code. So it worked a lot better, but they were supposed to give me some specs to redesign the rest of the stuff. And they were just not giving me the specs, but I didn't really push forward. And so instead of actually taking initiative and figuring out what was going on and actually building that software, I ended up playing Lord of the Rings online. I did that for about a year and just wasted that whole time. And then at the end of the year, it was like, yeah, John, you didn't really accomplish anything. I don't think we really want to do this business with you anymore, which I don't blame him at all. I also got hyper religious at the time and was preaching to them, which was not good either. I was an idiot back then. So what ended up happening was I had to, again, go back to a regular job. So I think at that time, I'm trying to think what job, I got to this other job working for this company called M2M Communications and they were doing these sort of remote, like using cellular technology to control sprinklers remotely. And it was a really cool job and I enjoyed it. And it was a really small company. I wrote some really cool code there, had a lot of fun. And I was actually gonna get some ownership in that company because the owner was a really cool guy, this guy, Steve Hodges. And I kind of blew that opportunity as well. Actually, they ended up selling the company and some of the other guys that were working for the 
company. They ended up making hundreds of thousand dollars, I think maybe even a million dollars in cash out. And I had left that company just before to work for another, for a contract that paid more money for the Department of Health and Welfare in Idaho, because one of my friends got hooked me up with that job. And I actually negotiated that job up to $75 an hour. And that job w was interesting because I had to come in there as a contractor and be this mentor. And at this time I had a lot of development experience and experience running teams. And I started implementing best practices, test driven involvement, all this kind of stuff. And you know, I was really in a very senior position there, but it was Java and I was used to doing .NET stuff. And so it was kind of cool. Like I learned a lot of things and I really had to learn Java, which isn't that different from C Sharp, which was what I was doing before. But I was kind of stuck. I was like, I can't really go up from here. There's not much I can do. And I was listening to all these software developers. I was reading so many blogs at the time. And I was like, it'd be so cool if I could be one of those guys and so finally I was like, I'm just gonna start a blog. So I started a blog and here we're finally getting to the business part of things called Simple Programmer. And that blog, it was just literally, I was writing three articles a week, just sharing the stuff that I was working on at work. It was almost like a passive aggressive way to communicate to my coworkers, like what best practices we should be doing. Because sometimes when you come from an authoritarian perspective and you're like, no, you guys need to be doing this. This is why we do test driven development. People try to do things to, undermine that, but if you come from a sort of an appeal to their logic type of perspective, like a very non-confrontational, then they listen. Right. So I started writing these blog posts and they would get shared around the office and then people would read them. They'd be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And then they would start, you know, I'd get buy-in. And they'd also think I'm famous because who has a blog? I have a blog, right? And people read my blogs. It would cause them to actually listen to what I had to say, but I had to just write it. Right. So anyway, I started that blog and I was writing about three posts a week and there was not very many people reading them. Some people in my office, my mom. And then what ended up happening though, was one day I got this call from this company and they basically called me up to offer me a job. And I was like, that's weird. I was like, you don't want to interview me? They're like, no, all our developers read your blog. I was like, wow, that's interesting. So I look at the stats on the blog and sure enough, it was like two, 300 people a day were reading my blog. I was like, wow, that's crazy. That's a lot of people. And some started clicking in my head and I was like, wow, there's this huge opportunity with a blog to market yourself because I was getting all these job offers. And so I ended up actually switching jobs shortly after that and I was able to get this job another government job as a contractor this time I was able to make hundred dollars an hour uh, this was at the DMV at the Idaho Department of Transportation I was working in that job as an agile consultant a very high level role and I I actually didn't like that job because I didn't like going into the office, but I kept on writing on the blog. And at that time I started doing some podcast interviews. And so I got on some of the fa this famous podcast at the time for .NET developers, Scott Hanselman. I got on his podcast called Hansel Minutes. And now I started to actually, like people knew who I was. So right. it was kind of cool. But at that time I'm making a hundred dollars an hour, but I still wasn't happy because I really wanted to work from home. And part of the reason why I wanted to work from home was because I, I didn't like the commute. I didn't like wasting time. And I was trying to work on these side projects at that time. And so I got this job uh, with this company called Track out and they were a completely remote job and I won't go into the details of how I got the job but basically I started stalking their developers and commenting on their blogs until they knew me before I applied for the job and then when the job opened up I was basically a shoe in for that job so I think at that job I was making about 110 hundred twenty thousand dollars a year as a salary though not a contractor at that point with benefits and everything like that and so that was a great job I enjoyed that job I got to work from home it was fantastic I was still living in Idaho at that point and again I was continuing to buy my properties maintain my properties and and then what ended up happening was that I got this opportunity to do some talks at what's called a code camp. At the time, what I decided was I started running and I decided that I was going to build an Android application because I wanted to learn Android just like I had learned Palm Pilot. And so I started learning in this Android programming, how to program in Java, Android. And I had this idea of creating this program called Pacemaker that was going to tell you when you're running, if you need to speed up or slow down so you could stay on pace, right? There wasn't really that technology at the time. There wasn't apps to do that. I didn't know about running watches. <laughs> I guess running watches that you can look at, but I wanted it in my ear. I wanted someone to say, slow down, speed up. So I came up with a plan for building this app and I started building out this app. And this was a key turning point in my life because it's where I became a finisher because I had this app and I got this designer to design the app to make it look cool, some of the screens for it. And I eventually got bored of this. And, I, and just like almost every other project in my life, I wanted to give up, especially when I got the designs back from the designer. And it was like, she gave me these designs that you could not do with the buttons in Android and the user interface. In order to do this, I had to figure out some way to custom create my own buttons and custom create my own toolbars and all this stuff. 
and it was just overwhelming. But I made a decision. I was like, look, John, what you're gonna do is you're gonna finish this thing. And all you're gonna do is you're gonna work on this for one hour every day after you get home from work at a minimum. That's it. It doesn't matter if you make progress. It doesn't matter what happens, but you're just going to do this thing. And so I committed to doing that. And lo and behold, I figured out how to solve all these problems. I made custom buttons. I made custom toolbars. I started becoming really good at Android development. It was crazy. And I completed the app and I put it in the app store. And that was just amazing. And so I ended up speaking at this code camp, this Boise code camp on advanced Android development, how to create a custom toolbar. And I did some other kind of presentation there and, and two things happened. So one was when that app went to the app store, I emailed a couple of magazines and I emailed Shape Magazine and Shape Magazine, this woman's fitness magazine. They're like, yeah, we'll put your app in there. And a issue of that magazine came out and my app was in there. It was featured in there. And then all of a sudden I got hundreds of downloads, hundreds of people buying my app. It wasn't a huge amount of money, but I made a couple thousand dollars. I was like, wow, this is crazy. I can literally write code, make an app, put it in an app store and then I get thousands of dollars and they just kept on coming in. Yeah. It wasn't a lot of money every month after that initial thing died down. It was like maybe 100, 200 bucks a month. But I was like, this is magic money because it's as close to passive income. As, yeah. And that really got my, my brain thinking because the real estate thing was a long term thing. And I was on the path to doing that, but it was painful because there was a point in my real estate career where I, I was in the negative cash flow and I was paying money every single month. So I was cropping it up. But I knew in the long term because of these charts that I had from that book that I was going to be okay. But anyway, so that happened. And then at that same time, this guy that was at that code camp, David Starr, he heard my presentation and he's like, hey, he's like, I kind of work for this company called Pluralsight and we're looking for two things. We're looking for someone to build an Android app for us and we're also looking for someone to do an Android course. He's like, are you interested in either one of those? I think I'm more interested in building an Android app. And he said, well, why don't you put in a proposal for building an Android app? But why don't you put in an audition for building the Android course as well, just so you can do both of them? And I was like, I, I don't know. I don't really want to teach a course. I think I'd rather build the app. And he's like, well, you should just do it. And I was like, fine, I'll, I'll listen to you. I'll do it. I ended up putting a proposal for building the Android app. And I think they're going to pay me like $6,000 or $10,000 to build this app. That'll be cool to make six or $10,000 to build this app. And I actually got rejected for that. They're like, no, we hired someone else. But... I made an audition tape and it was, I didn't know about video editing. Okay. So I literally, I went over to David Starr's house cause he's like, oh, you can use my recording equipment to do that. And I think I, I make a 15 minute demo audition tape of the lesson I was gonna teach the first module of Android development. And it took me, I think four hours to record it. And he was like, dude, what took you so long? And he saw the finished product. He's like, it came out really good, but what took you so long? I was like, well, every time I made a mistake, cause I would say, or I'd say the wrong thing, or I'd click on the wrong thing. I had to start over. And, he was like, you don't have to start over. You can just edit that out. You can retake. You don't have to start over from the beginning. And so I was like, wow, that's crazy. Well, <laughs> he's like, you literally spent four hours trying to do it all. You did this 15 minutes perfectly in one take. I was like, yeah, after four hours. So anyway, I submitted the audition and they loved it. And they're like, oh yeah, you have a natural talent for this. And so we want to bring you on to do this course. And they're going to pay me, I think, they paid me, I want to say $6,000 to do the course, which was pretty cool. And there was this whole thing where they paid royalties if you had more than, I think, seven or eight hours worth of course content in their platform. And so a lot of authors would do two or three courses and get up to that. But I was like, well, you know what? I should make this Android development course seven hours from the beginning. So I made it really long. I had to cover a ton of things. I just filled in until I got to that point. And so I did the course, they paid me and it was long. And I was like, oh, I'm never going to do that again. That was a lot of work because it was a lot of work, especially doing all the editing and, and coming up with all the exercises and, and recording all that stuff. And so I did that and I didn't really think much of it. I was still working my job. I think at that time also I was in the process of moving. So I moved back to Florida again. And then I remember I got in the mail a check for something like, I think my first check was like $3,000. And that wasn't the check they paid me, the 6,000. It was a royalty check for one quarter for three months based on the views of my course. And I was like, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. This is insane. I mean, I made this course and I already got paid 6,000 and now I got paid $3,000. And if this keeps up, the next three months from now, I'll get $3,000 again. And who knows how long, maybe I'll get another 15, $20,000 from this one course I made. So I emailed Polarstein and I was like, I'm ready to do more courses. And they're like, what do you want to do a course on? Like, you want to do another Android course? And I was like, I'm going to port my application over to iOS, which was I was thinking about doing anyway. And I'll do a course on iOS development. I literally learned iOS, ported my application, my pacemaker application to iOS, launched it in the iOS the Apple store. And then I created a Pluralsight course on iOS development. And again, you know, they paid me a few thousand dollars for that one. 
And then the royalty check came in, the next royalty check, and it was like $5,000 because it was some for this course, some for that course. And so I was like, bingo. So I said, let's do another course. So I can't remember what the next course I did, but I kept on doing one course after another course and after another course. It would take me like two months to do a course at that point in time. And so at the same time, I was working this regular job at Trackabout, this remote company from Florida. And my days were crazy at that time. It was like, I would wake up in the morning and I would go to the gym or I'd go for a run. And then I would immediately go to work at my regular job, working all day. And it wasn't a super cush job. The boss that I had there was a micromanager to a degree. So we were on our chat, our chat app, it was Slack that we were using at the time, and he would check your idle status. So you had to be there, like you had to be there, you had to, you know, he would check in on you a lot during the day and stuff. So I couldn't even work on other stuff. Like I could not record Pluralsight courses during, and I know a lot of you guys today, you can do that, so you're lucky. But at that time, I had to work the eight hours. And then I would eat dinner, take a little bit of a break, and then I would spend four more hours every single night recording Pluralsight courses, working on my blog, and my podcast. And that's what I did. And I lived that life. And on weekends, I would just work. That was it. I didn't do anything else. I had no social activities. All I did for two and a half years was just work and work out. That's it. But I knew that if I did this, I would be set for my life. I knew that on top of the real estate, because I knew that I could take this money and I could start paying off that real estate early. Now, that doesn't turn out to be the best strategy. Let me tell you, it's not the best, smartest thing to do, but I knew that was something that I could do. Again, sometimes my plans in life, like the way they come up with plans, is I figure out what is the brute force way? What, what could not possibly fail? And so speaking of that, what I figured out with the Pluralsight thing, is I said, oh, here's the deal. If I am the top author, if I have the most courses on Pluralsight, then I will make the most money. And I knew that some authors were making over $100,000 a year just in royalties. And so I said, if I do that, all I have to do is make sure that I have the most courses on Pluralsight. In fact, what I want to do is I want to double the amount of courses that the top author has right now. And I think it was 12. So I wanted to make 24 courses and I'd have to make more because obviously he'd keep making courses as well. And I said, if I do that, I will be set for life because I'll be a millionaire because I'll get those royalties. And that company was growing. And my royalty checks at that time were like twenty, thirty thousand dollars right? Imagine at that time, just getting a check for $30,000 every three months for doing nothing. That's what my life was like. It was crazy town. Right? So that's why I had the motivation to work for two and a half years without a break, just working like a dog 70 hours a week. Because so I knew that this small sacrifice of two and a half years of my life or whatever it was, I would end up being set for life. And so I ended up working, I think, for a track about at that time and doing pro site courses for another year and a half. And then I quit because, <laughs> and I had called up my boss and he was like, oh, why are you quitting? I was like, I love the job. He's like, can we pay you more money? I was like, no. And he's like, why? I was like, I just got a royalty check check last month for $70,000. That's like, I've already made more money in passive income from royalty checks than you guys are gonna pay me this whole year. And so I got this contract with Pluralsight because Pluralsight wanted to really ramp up their courses because they had some competition out there. I think lynda.com was the competition at the time. And so I talked to the CEO of Pluralsight, Aaron Sconard, and I was like, I was a little bit scared of not having medical insurance, all this stuff. And I was like, look, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna quit my job then I need to make sure I'm making a, a lot of income, build a cover medical insurance and that I've got some guarantees here. So he's like, well, what can we do? I said, can you offer me some kind of incentive? Can you guarantee me some number of courses? So he's like, look, here's the deal. If you can do, commit to doing 30 courses this year, which is an insane number of courses. Most authors were taking two months, three months to do one course, but I started getting it down where I could get to do a course in one month. And, and I was pretty sure that I could get it down to three weeks or two weeks. So I figured if I quit my job and did this full time, I could do a course in maybe a week, maybe two weeks at the most. So I can get this 30 courses done. And so he said, we'll give you double what we normally pay you for courses. So I think normally for courses, it was like four or $5,000, depending on the size of the course. So he's like, we'll give you $8,000 per course you did. And plus you'll get the royalties. So I was like, I'll do that. So I spent that year working like a dog, even worse. Cause I mean, I was working just ridiculous hours and I pumped out courses. I remember being halfway through it and running on the beach, just ready to just freaking blow my brains out. Cause I was just so exhausted and listening to the war of art by Stephen Pressfield on repeat. And that book saved my life. That literally saved my life, the war of art. So by the way, if you're listening so far here and you want to become financially free, click link down below, book a call, 15 minute call. You're gonna get a free call with a member of my team and we will go over a financial freedom plan for you and see if you're a good fit for my Well That Never Runs Dry financial freedom program, which basically condenses everything I'm telling you in this story down into like a five-year time frame where you could actually become financially free in five years and not make all the mistakes that I did. So click the link and book a call down there below. And if you want one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, you can go to bulldogmindset.com and look for the coaching tab there. I usually have it filled up 
because I only accept so many coaching clients, but if you want to do that, that's an option for you as well. So I finished it up, I made it. And at that time, I think at the peak, when I I was getting royalty checks for $125,000 a quarter. And I was making like over $500,000 a year in royalties from Pluralsight. Now you might say, John, did you just keep on making Pluralsight courses? And wouldn't that be the smart thing to do? And that would have been the smart thing to do if I was just after money. But I read a book by 50 Cent and Robert Greene called The 50th Law. And in that 50 Cent actually said something, he said, own your corner. And I realized that I was at the mercy of Pluralsight. Actually at that point, I very quickly became financially free. I can't remember exactly what the time span was, but this was in a five year time span that I went from starting that company at track about, or started doing the Pluralsight courses to pay, I massively paid off my real estate. And my goal was to get to $5,000 of passive income per month. And I hit that at the age of 33, which was February 14th of 2013 was when I became financially free. And I was gonna do it from the real estate alone, but this business income accelerated. And that's why uh, I was talking about my wallet never runs dry program, why I don't just advocate just real estate investment, even though you could do that in, in 20, 30 years, you can become financially free or maybe 15 years, like I said, with the original plan. But if you can build a business and get a bunch of money to dump into the real estate, now I don't recommend paying off all the real estate like I did, that was just dumb because I thought I was just gonna, be financially free and then live on a beach somewhere, which was not what I actually did. And I tried to do that, but it was not a good plan. So I said, uh, here's the deal. I'm already financially free right? and I'm already a multimillionaire at this point. Right. So I was like, I don't need to just focus on just making money. Instead, what I need to do is I need to own my own corner. So what I ended up doing at that point was I said, right, I am going to focus my efforts on Simple Programmer. I'm no longer going to create Pluralsight courses. Instead, I'm gonna create courses on my own platform. Now, at that time, I was learning some digital marketing and I was starting to build my email list. And I created a course called How to Market Yourself as Software Developer. That was the first product that I ever sold myself. At that time, I only had an email list of 3,000 people. One of my good friends, Josh Earl, who eventually became a business partner of Simple Programmer, I was on this mastermind group that I still have going. It's, it's called Entreprogrammer. It was called Entreprogrammer. If you go to entreprogrammers.com, you can check it out. Now it's called Business Mastermind Podcast. But at that time, he was telling me I need to start an email list. So I finally listened to him. I started this email list and I created this product called How to Market Yourself as Software Developer. And long story short, I ended up selling it for $300 at, at launch and it, it taught people how to market themselves as a software developer. And so I was teaching other people how to do that and the benefits of doing that, how to start a blog and all, all these things. And so I ended up launching this course and I remember on launch day, I wasn't sure about selling it for $300. I sold it for $300 with a $100 discount on the launch. And I was like, oh, I was gonna pay $200 for this. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And I was nervous about this thing. And I was like, people are gonna think I'm a sellout and all this stuff. So I had emailed my list. And when I sent out the email, first email to list announcing the sale, I, I got one sale and then like half an hour went by and there's no more sales. I was like, great, I made $200. And then I remember, all of a sudden these sales start coming in. And so I went to, out to dinner that night, I was eating at this nice restaurant and I was looking at my phone and it was like $200, $200, $200, $200, $200. $200. Long story short, in two days, I made $25,000. And I was like, wow, this is even better than the Pluralsight. The Pluralsight was good and it was really good because that company kept on growing. But I was like, if I can scale this up, then I can really make some money. So what I ended up doing was that was really one of the main factors that said, okay, I need to put my effort into Simple Programmer and forget about Pluralsight. And it was a tough decision. And was it the right decision? It depends on how you look at it. I have now Simple Programmer and Bulldog Mindset and I'm making more money than I was ever at Pluralsight with those companies combined, especially with Bulldog Mindset now. But if I had continued doing Pluralsight courses, I probably would have gotten to a point where I was making a couple million dollars a year in royalties. That's probably true, which is more than I'm doing now. But it's not all about money because part of the problem I had with Pluralsight was I was like, I still don't feel like I'm my own man. Like I'm not my own self-made man because I'm dependent on them. Yes, I'm making the courses, but they're marketing it, they're selling it. It's their company, it's not mine. Anyway, I started working on Unsimple Programmer, started growing that, you know, creating more articles, building more products, relaunching the how to market yourself as a software developer, creating emails, campaigns, and all kinds of stuff and really grew that company to a point where I actually launched a second product called 10 Steps to Learn Anything Quickly. And I hired one of the guys that actually worked with me at Track About, Josh Earl, who I, who I told you about, who's in that mastermind group of men. I hired him as a copywriter because he was learning copywriting and he wanted, I think, 
$5,000 to do the sales page and all the emails for this new, new course that I was gonna sell. But I was like, no, I'm, I'm gonna pay you $5,000 plus 10% of everything we make over $5,000 because I want you to have skin in the game. So he did this awesome job on it. We did this launch for this course and we made $50,000. So wow, this is crazy, it's awesome. And so I realized I need this guy on my team. So I made an offer to him to work with me and I'd pay him as a contractor. And then when we reach a certain income, <laughs> which is funny, this was the exact same offer that I was basically given right back when I screwed this up with my friend with ABU games Gabriel with the Magic the Gathering store but I gave this offer to Josh and he took me up on it and we grew the company to the point where we were making around 50 to 60 thousand dollars a month and splitting that or he was getting paid on that and then when we hit that point he hit the milestone where he owned 50 percent of the company so now he owned 50 percent of the company and we're splitting this and we're making 50 60k a month but here again was where I was somewhat greedy and somewhat stupid is that <laughs> I kind of got bored with the simple programmer stuff and I had been trying to retire after I'd actually become financially free. And the timeline is a little wonky here because some things were happening asynchronously, but I went to Hawaii to try and live there for two months. Basically, I kept on trying to retire. So I wanted to get out of the company, have him run the company and I wanted to do something different. So I actually, that's when I started a Bulldog Mindset. And when I started spending more of my effort on Bulldog Mindset, I think Josh lost the vision of the company and I was kind of the leader of the company. And so the revenue started going down and he felt like we couldn't sell anything anymore. And he had this kind of negative viewpoint on the company, which not his fault because I had basically had abandoned him in the company thinking he had this great opportunity. So he needs to take it over now and run everything. And he did a good job for a while, but eventually my focus was on Bulldog Mindset. And so he started shifting his focus. And so I started getting pissed. So I was like, look, you've got to run this company. Like you can't be doing any side thing. I'm giving this great opportunity. And you, you could make arguments either way, but I think I was being foolish at the time, honestly. But eventually I was working on Bulldog Mindset stuff. And I realized that like, <laughs> He owns 50% of this company. It's kind of autopilot because I had actually, in this time frame, I didn't even talk about this. I wrote a book called Soft Skills, Soft Developers Life Manual, which I published with Manning, a traditional publisher. And that book went crazy. It went international bestseller. I made a shit ton of money from that book with my 10% royalty. But then I launched a second book called The Complete Software Developer Career Guide with Josh. And it was self-published. And we did even better than that. I ended up getting in the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, which first time a software development book had ever done that in the history of Wall Street Journal. But anyway, we made a lot of money from that book. But mostly what was happening with Simple Programmer is there was just this passive income that was coming in because we were selling like twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a month in courses from automated emails from writers that were writing on the blog and then people coming in from there. And then the book's making like $20,000 a month as well. And so it was like $40,000, $50,000 a month coming in. And I was like, well, I don't really want to just split this 50-50 if he's not working on growing the business. And I was working on Bulldog Mindset stuff. So I basically gave him an offer. I was like, look, I'll buy you out of the business. So I forget what the actual end up price for buying him out for half of the company was, but it was something like, I want to say $300,000. So I did an installment plan of paying him like $6,600 for like three years or something like that. And while I was doing that, what ended up happening was, of course, no one's working on this business. So it starts going down. <laughs> so basically, very quickly, the business exists to do nothing but pay Josh out of the business. He's paid off now and I own the business 100% and it's making decent money now. Not a huge amount, maybe five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month because no one's really working on the business. But I'm going to revamp that and bring that back up. But so that happened. And then in the meantime, I, I slowed down on my property buying once I had hit yeah. the financial freedom number, but so I ended up buying a commercial property, doing a 1031 exchange, selling a bunch of properties and putting into this $1.2 million commercial property. And then I haven't bought a lot recently. I did some other investments into some, some other things, but I've been more, mostly focused on the business stuff. So anyway, I got Bulldog Mindset started. I shifted the YouTube channel over this YouTube channel from Simple Programmer to Bulldog Mindset. And I started a membership on there. And originally when I started Bulldog Mindset, I was happy to make a thousand, two thousand dollars a month on this new business because it was cool. It was a new business. It was like, I'm already making forty, fifty thousand dollars a month from Simple Programmer. Why do I even care? And this is just a fun thing. And eventually, pretty quickly, I got to the point of making $10,000 a month in Bulldog Mindset. And this was the, really the thing that I wanted to do because, you know, there's a whole backstory because we're just talking about the financial aspect of things. But you know, there's a whole backstory about like, the, my own personal development story, reading books. And, and, and I think that's probably tied into the financial aspect of things. But we don't have enough time for me to go into all the books I read and how that impacted everything in my life because there's a lot. There's a lot of threads here to weave together. So we're just looking at a very, very small scope of this. But anyway, I started putting all my focus 
focus into bulldog mindset at that point and growing that and growing the membership. And so I made good money from the membership. And then people kept on asking me for coaching. So at first I was doing coaching for $500 an hour, which I thought was crazy. Cause when I was in simple programmer, I was doing programming for $350 an hour, which was insane bill rate, but people were asking me for that. And then I started doing coaching for $500 an hour. And then I got to a point in the business where I was like, I don't really want to jump on a call and talk to someone for $500. It's just not worth it. I have money coming in from real estate. I had money coming in from plural sites still. I had money coming in from simple programmer and now Bulldog Mindset. And I was like, eh, it's just, it's not worth my time. So next time someone asked me for coaching, I said, it's a thousand dollars for an hour. And they said, yes. So like, I'll do it for a thousand dollars for, yeah, I'll, I'll jump on a call and talk. We'll talk for a thousand dollars and I'll help you. And so, you know, that ended up happening. And then eventually got to the point where I was making enough money. I was like, I don't want a thousand dollars for to talk to someone. I was like, I'll do it for 1500. And that's where I'm at now is that I, I charge $1,500 and I had some really good success with a lot of my coaching clients is in at first it was just, I just did a few coaching. In fact, I only did the coaching initially just to pay for my mom who has Parkinson's her care because I needed to pay for some full-time workers to be able to take care of her because my dad couldn't take care of her by herself and she's got her deathbed now unfortunately any day now i'm gonna have to go fly there and and, uh, and that'll be it but it's it's been a long time it's been like seven years now so it's tough it, it still hasn't fully hit me yet but i it's starting to i think but anyway because it's not just that she's dying it's just that it's like such a horrible and painful and just it just i, I can't even describe it like when someone just slowly like they disappear, like they lose themselves and they lose their mind and their all functionality of their, of their body. It's just a horrible thing. If, if you ever read uh, Tuesdays with Maury, I think that's a decent book that, that could help you understand it a little bit. But anyway, so I had to pay for the full-time care. So the whole thing was like, if I do coaching, I have a three coaching clients, it'll pay for that. But I kept on getting high demand for this. So I ended up scaling it up and just, I'm at, I think, 25 coaching clients now. And I had some real good success. And one of my best coaching clients, we started off with nothing, just from zero. He was just a software developer. And last year he made over $2 million of profit with his YouTube channel and selling courses, basically doing the exact same thing that, that I did. And again, I haven't talked about all the aspects of the business, but essentially with Simple Programmer, I built an audience and then I built a course, and I built an email list and then built a course and sold that course. And then with Bulldog Mindset, I iterated on that and made a better version of it where I built an audience and then I built a membership and it was recurring income plus had the coaching and then my latest thing which i talked about a little bit earlier is the well that never runs dry complete financial freedom program and that's a high ticket program so that's more expensive in the thousands of dollars product again if you want to check that out click the link down below you can book a call and see if you're qualified to get into the program i'm pretty selective on that one so i taught him those techniques helped him to grow that thing a couple other coaching clients where they did a couple hundred thousand dollars a year from their channel and a million dollars and helped a whole bunch of people buy property i don't know how many people i've helped buy real estate and become financially free from that and get on or get on the path to financial freedom i think that kind of brings us pretty close to today and i rush the end part here but at this point there's so many things going on between the different books that are being used as lead magnets, between the books that are still on Simple Programmer, some courses that are on Simple Programmer, affiliate partnerships I do with the email list for Simple Programmer and with Bulldog Mindset, selling Bulldog Mindset membership, selling the high ticket that never runs dry program with the coaching and all that. There's a lot of stuff going on, but I enjoy it. Yeah. I like it and and that's, and I'm making good money yeah. at this point. And from real estate, I'm at about $15,000 a month passive income. You can check out my income reports every single month. I do them every single month and show you exactly my QuickBooks, what I'm making. And then Bulldog Mindset is pretty much on track to do about a million dollars a year now, which is cool. I know for some people, that's not a huge amount of money. For me, doing what I love to do, not just chasing the money, I think it's perfect. I'm learning, I'm continually learning and developing myself. But, but yeah, that's, that's my good. whole financial freedom story, how I got to, to where I am here. And there's other pieces of this about developing my confidence, developing myself as, as a man, physical fitness, relationships, dating, all the, all those type of things that I had to go through that kind of helped me on this, this road. But the big thing, like I said, was that if I boiled it down and that's what I did with this wall program is I got a ha high paying job so that I could afford to buy one property a year, which isn't a huge amount of ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for a down payment per year, maybe $30,000. It's really not that big of an amount. And, and then I execute on that. And then I started a business or multiple businesses actually, and grew an audience and then figured out a way to sell a product to the audience, which you can always do and had success from there. And then you know, created a membership, different products, and then eventually a high ticket program where I've got a sales team that, that sells that. And that's the, that next iteration to kind of taking me up to that, that next level all the time. I'm still making passive income. I'm still doing Doing the coaching for now eventually i'm going to phase out the coaching and not do coaching because it's just too taxing on my time it's like even when you're making 1500 dollars an hour at some point it doesn't become worth it maybe i'll charge really high ticket 
$3,000 an hour to do coaching at some point, but that's, and I enjoy doing the coaching, but it, it just, it, my Wednesdays are crazy because it's completely booked with coaching calls every single because I, I reserve my Wednesdays for coaching calls. But yeah, that's it. That's my long story. My voice is about out here. Again, click the link down below to jump on a 15 minute call with a member of my team. And if you have any questions about my financial story live, ask them and I'll try to answer them or one of my community managers or helpers will, who knows me really well, will, will answer them for you. And if you haven't joined the Bulldog Mindset membership, or if you don't have the money to join the Well Then Everyone's Drive program, which I totally understand, if you're not quite there yet, definitely join the membership. Let's go to bulldogmindset.com and take the quiz and then you'll get an offer to, to join the membership there. Or, you, or just go on bulldogmindset.com and, and you can find the membership under the products there. Every single one of you should be in the membership because it's just a hell of a deal. It's 40 bucks a month is what it comes down to. It's $7, I think, for the first month if, if you do the promo. It's, it's a hell of a deal because you're gonna get a ton of knowledge and information and community there. That's a no brainer. If I were you, I would do that. I would do the platinum membership so you get lifetime access while I still have that. And then if you can afford to do the well, that never run strive program, I think taking everything that I've learned in this process and condensing it down is extremely valuable. I really think it's extremely valuable for you guys to do that because I wish I had that. I wish I could have plopped down a few thousand dollars and instead of spending 20 years <laughs> learning this and beating my head against the wall and making so many mistakes that I could have just got it and had someone to answer all my questions for me. That would have really helped me. I'd be further along than I am now, but I guess part of the reason why I went down the path I did is so I can teach you guys. Because right. if I hadn't taken the hard knocks, I wouldn't be as good of a teacher. So, you know, that's the way I look at it. But yeah, if you have any questions, like I said, let me know. If you doubt anything that I'm saying here, check the income reports. I try to be as transparent as possible, like I said, so you guys can see this. Because I, I want you guys to be successful in it. And I think it, it really just disturbs me so much when I hear people that are like, oh yeah, that's some bullshit. Buy a property every year or just start a business, dude. I'd post that. Instagram and someone had uh, commented like that. And it's, it's sad <laughs> because there is a whole life out here for you that you don't even know. Like, I know who I am. I know the nerdy, dorky, lazy, socially awkward guy that I am. Like, not that I was, but like, that's truly who I am. And I know that if I can do that, if I can have the kind of life that I have, becoming a multimillionaire, becoming financially free, building the physique that I never thought possible, having the, the relationships and the dating life that I had and that and having the wonderful woman that I am with now, my fiance, that you guys can do it. That, that's the thing is that's why I get so upset at the people who preach otherwise and try to discourage you is because you can do this. If you have some help, you have someone who's been down the path, who's done it before, it's gonna go a long way. That's why I'm here. Whether you ever buy anything from me or not, and you just listen to these videos, then listen to the videos and execute on it. If you want some extra help, like I said, I'm here. You can pay for the programs that I offer. If not, just listen to the videos, but at least execute on this and take advantage of this because you can have a way different life than like, if I can do this, you can absolutely do this. That's the big thing that I want to communicate to you guys. I know some of you guys still don't believe in yourself and you still don't believe it, but believe me, I made it. You heard how many mistakes I made in the story, but I got here. So if I can do that and I can get here and I'm still growing, I'm still learning. Believe me, I still have a lot to learn then you can do this. So don't give up. Don't listen to the, this is too good to be true. Just try it out. Just execute. And hey, at the very least, if you fail, which you won't, but if you did, you would have given it everything you got. You would feel better about yourself. You would feel more fulfilled in life knowing that you didn't just accept the mediocre. You didn't just accept the cubicle life that you went and you pursued building a business. You pursued investing in real estate. You pursued doing these things and not just on the financial aspect, but in your physical reality as well and in building yourself and in developing yourself, like you went after these things. That's gonna what's gonna matter in the end. Like I said, if you have any questions, leave a, leave a comment below and, and I'll answer them.